Good afternoon and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Brandi Powell and I'm with Emerson working on variable speed projects um, in residential and commercial markets. Um, the other guest we have today with us is Jeff Christian and he is an energy efficient specialist with over 30 years of experience in the industry um, working with Oak Ridge National Labs as well as uh, other subject matter expert and industry affiliations. So welcome, Jeff. We're pleased to have you. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Brandy. So that's just a quick bio here on the screen of the two of us, and I'm sure you heard that from uh, Gerald as well. I wanted to quickly move into why we're here today. So I wanted to welcome everyone to the third webinar in a series called Designer Air. We'll talk a little bit about what is Designer Air, but today we're focused mainly on the residential market and specifically about um, what do homeowners really want? What are they looking for? Uh, we have a lot of survey information back from homeowners, a lot of experience Jeff has with them. And then we'll talk about um, what that is they're looking for, comfort and energy, and then how that can be delivered to them. What are some of the technologies to do it? And probably best yet are several real life examples that um, Jeff can share with us uh, full of data and a lot of experience. So hold on for that because I think that'll be pretty interesting today. So let's kind of move into what is designer air. Um, there are a lot, you know, everybody wants to upgrade their home and they think about things like kitchens and basements, things that you can see that create a nice impression you feel like you're getting a payback for. But one of the best ways to upgrade your home isn't just countertops and windows, although I like those a lot. Um, it's particularly in your environmental control or your climate controls. Not only are you more comfortable, but quite often you're getting a much better payback for those types of investments. So we call that uh, designer error when you can look for some of these higher end solutions that offer you more benefits to comfort and energy savings than what you may typically have. So what is comfort? It's very difficult to define, and I know several of you probably are, are, are have various definitions of what it is. Probably depends on where you live, too. But uh, you don't always know when you're comfortable because you're not thinking about it, but you definitely know when you're not comfortable. Those days where it's hot and sweaty, those nights when it's sticky and you can't get to sleep, those are all the things we don't want to remember but are probably uh, top of our mind when it's happening to us. So when we think of comfort, it is a perception. It's probably different from everyone. I'm sure, you know, as a, as a wife, you want it probably a lot warmer than the husband wants it or whatnot. So we all have different set points. It can be ambiguous. Um, it's easier to identify as being uncomfortable. Um, and there's not a lot of uh, statistics around it. It can be, you know when it's right, but you, uh, you, sometimes it's too hot and sometimes it's too cold. So you're looking for that just right in between. And while it's difficult to put a number on what is comfort, there are some aspects that we can measure. Temperature is one of them. Uh, it's not a complete number, but it is a pretty good guidance. Humidity is a big one, particularly depending on where you live. Uh, we see a lot of that in the southeast and coastal areas. Some other aspects are even fan speed. Just an adjustment or ability to change your fan speed can provide comfort. And for some folks, just even the sound, reducing the airflow, the system cycling, perhaps if you have a lot of outside or um, activities, the sound created by the outdoor unit as well. So comfort is more than just kind of feeling good. It, it surrounds all of your senses. And these are some of the typical ways that we can measure or look at comfort today. We're going to probably provide you with some more. Jeff's got a lot of ways to look at those. Temperature control, one of the nice things about um, Modulation, you can see the difference in the chart, is it provides a more even temperature control so you don't see the big swings that you do typically in a fixed speed system. On humidity control, these modulation or stage systems provide better humidity control because they really run longer at a slower speed. And so as a result, you're consistently able to pull moisture out of the air. And um, you can save energy while doing that as opposed to turning them on and off and living through the swings. Another benefit we sometimes see with modulation technologies is uh, in particular heat pump applications. Depending on how the unit is sized for the house, those type of technologies can deliver extra capacity when it gets cold, say down below 10 degrees ambient all the way to zero. So it's like having two heat pumps in one, if you will, 
uh, you get a lot more capacity for it. So that enables the comfort to have hotter heating air and more of it in those cold days. So those are just some of the ways that we think about comfort. I'm sure you folks also have ways as well. We recently did a, a buying survey from homeowners asking um, what they want when they buy that next HVAC system. And surprisingly, we had over 50%, 56 to be exact, who want energy benefits, better payback, more efficiency, a lower energy bill every month, but they also want comfort as well. But the rub is that they don't always buy it. So faced with that decision, only 22% actually buy that. Well, why is that? We do know that um, a lot of times when people are actually faced with making that decision for a system, they're there because the system they have isn't working, so it's not planned. Sometimes perhaps they don't understand what the options are for comfort. These are some of the holdbacks for them, budgeting, competing upgrades, maybe they are looking at the countertops. The initial cost of ownership is more for some of these systems versus the total cost. HVAC is out of sight, out of mind. It doesn't look as good as a countertop, not as fancy as that new bathroom that you would put in place. Another way that you can potentially um, look at bringing modulating type systems or better systems to homeowners is the changing loads. So Jeff will talk a lot about um, when you go to make upgrades, if you put a system, a system that can, that can uh, operate well with changing loads into a house before you add windows or tighten up the house, it's okay because it's able to handle those changing loads. So once all the retrofits get done, it's the perfect system for that house. Whereas if you had put a fixed speed in there, it now might be oversized for that particular location. These technologies also have the ability to shift schedules. Uh, you can use them with peak load demanding if utilities offer um, demand response, those type of activities. It allows you to be able to kind of shift the schedules for the system. So there's a lot of traditional ways to look at these. Uh, we'll walk through some of the ways that you can increase comfort and efficiency together. One of the other things we noted was 53% of the contractors, a lot of you, will use increased comfort as a benefit to upsell their customers. So that's really good because that's one of the things they're looking for. And what we want to show you today is some of the ways that you can actually deliver that. So we talked about um, one, the best way to deliver comfort is using these modulation technologies. Those can be uh, two-stage, actually five stages, fully variable stage. Um, it can be variable speed blowers help as well, but there's a lot of different ways to deliver that. And um, what we see is a changing landscape going on. As the regulations have hit in 2015, we also see more incentives coming from the utilities that, um, that help homeowners pay down or incentivize them for these premium or mid-tier type technologies. And those are the technologies where you usually see the modulation and the efficiency come together, which is exactly what the homeowners are looking for. They're typically in 16 SEER and above, um, and they offer you or the homeowner a premium system that meets their comfort, but also the contractors a way to sell up. So we've quickly put a polling question in there, trying to understand where uh, the folks who are online are from. So if you could take a few seconds and answer that, we'll let you see the results. Okay, I think that'll come up here in another uh, probably 90 seconds. You'll see that. And you should be seeing that on the right-hand side of your screen. So while modulation is really the best way to deliver comfort and efficiency to these homeowners, we'll look at what that means in a retrofit situation and in a new home situation. But we'll be able to control these things that we see on here. Why modulation when you're talking to a homeowner? So you can see the different ways that you can try to control the comfort, also provide you uniform temperature throughout the home. So it will better be able to manage those hot and cold spots that homeowners typically uh, complain about. You'll also see improvements in seasonal efficiency, SEER or HSPF as you're all familiar with, and part load efficiency. Um, one of the drawbacks of modulation, depending on what kind it is, is the full load may be a little bit different in these scenarios, and that's something you'll see as Jeff addresses it. 
Furthermore, the systems seem to be more reliable, and a lot of that has to come from the fact that we don't cycle the systems as much, and as a result, they don't shut on and off as often, which uh, often shortens the life. So you actually end up with a more reliable system when it runs continuously. These are some applications where you might see these type of technologies today. So typically a mid-tier system will have some stage technology, whether it's a ultra-tech, two-step type of compression, um, variable speed, indoor fans, or variable speed compressors with inverters. Those are all ways that you would find modulation in premium and mid-tier systems. They're also used in high comfort applications, and we see them now in geothermal applications as well. This is just a quick, when we walk through the case studies that Jeff will show you, he'll look at some of the different um, technologies, and he'll talk about fixed speed or single stage technology, and that's typically that top line that you see. It's typically two to six horsepower in the applications he's talking about. The part load efficiency is good. The full load efficiency, which sometimes the utilities are looking at, are actually the highest in those type of technologies. And it has good comfort when it's coupled with a variable speed indoor fan. But if you're really looking for more energy efficiency and a higher level of comfort, you need to look at the next two rows. Those are modulating technology. By that, it modulates on the compression side as well as on the airflow side. So two stage is uh, in two to six horsepower today has very good part load efficiency, and it also has very high load full load, full load efficiency. So that's a technology that kind of does well across the board, and it has good comfort, or I should say a high level of comfort as well. Variable speed technology is the newest on the market, and it's typically a compressor coupled with a large motor control. You see it in that picture there. Uh, some folks refer to them as inverter technology. And it has um, the highest part load efficiency, so when you're running it at low speeds, it's very efficient. Um, but it only has medium full load efficiency, so in those really hot days, perhaps if you live in Arizona or whatnot, or the really cold days if you're in a heat pump, that's where it won't have the best efficiency. But it does have the highest comfort because it can match um, any load across a wide range. So you'll see uh, the case studies. These are the technologies you'll see that he studied. So as we move forward, I'm going to hand off to Jeff, and he's going to show you how um, a lot of these comfort technologies we've been talking about and what it really means in these case studies as far as energy efficiency and payback. So Jeff, please uh, please take the baton. Okay. Thank you, Brandy. Uh, I, I first got introduced with uh, variable speed and variable capacity on a, on a pursuit while well, I was at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory towards zero energy houses. And I kept saying it was so, so important to right size and to have the right size unit. And as we discovered these very small, very efficient houses, I first got awakened to the enormous benefit of having this variable capacity that actually did a much better job in the cooling side, but also on cold days and the heating side. And what you're going to hear is um, about four or five cases of just things that have come up in these projects that variable capacity advantages have, have shown them, themselves uh, to me. And uh, Brandy did a wonderful job of talking about comfort, energy savings. The cost incentive is an interesting one. Right now I'm on a project where it's one of the first in the country, in the southeast, to do time of day rates. And utilities are very, very interested in that peak. And I actually had a project that I created that would be zero peak to zero energy. Well, that's very much a reality in this project. And utilities are offering uh, incentives, not just for ordinary uh, fixed speed, but for some of the um, modulating and the um, multiple speed systems that we're going to be talking about. So that was something I hadn't realized how close that is. And I've had people say, yeah, 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 time of day, we've heard about that. It's 20 years away. It's living right here um, in, uh, in, the, in the south in this, in this particular project. Um, the, uh, the, and working with a lot of contractors, and the, the, as, as I kind of went to a new area and looked for who was the better contractors in the area, one of the first places I went to was the code officials and the utilities. And boy, are they ready to offer those contractors that deliver. 
and they all have programs, and, and indeed, it's a very quick way of finding those, those premium contractors. And so with so many contractors on the, on the line here, uh, be sure that you've impressed your local utility program and code official of your, of your knowledge. Uh, if I could get to the next one. Absolutely. I'm going to see if I can't get through five uh, pro, uh, these things. I'll try to be quick without talking too fast. Uh, we may not get to all of them, but the full presentation will be on the website. But each of them has taught us something, and it goes from um, the mega house, which is uh, 8,200 square feet, brand new house. And when the contractor called me and said, hey, I need an energy efficiency guy. Can you help me? I said, yeah, build a house about one-third of size. But that didn't go over too well. So I thought, well, bravo for him for at least making this very large house very efficient. And a fantastically interesting story that starts with a budget that was about the budget you'd expect in a house about uh, 1,500 for the HVAC. Yet it's a million something dollar house. So that was an interesting project. You'll see a little bit about that. And then from that extreme to a less than 1,000 square foot little bungalow, and this was my thing. After the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, I needed a little time to recover. I bought this little cute house. And I said, I'm going to do what I've been trying to preach around the country. Get a small house, reduce your cost on all the space that you probably don't need, and get it right, high quality, very efficient. So you're going to hear that story. The greenhouse, really interesting one. Here's a in you know, can we do energy efficiency and historic renovation under the same roof? Well, if you heard all the words Brandy kept saying, you know what we do really well with variable capacity? We do moisture control. You know what? You know what keeps stuff lasting a long time? Good moisture control. Museums are really tight. They're the premium example of, of plus or minus a half a percent of RH so that artwork doesn't get destroyed. So that was a fantastic project and, and very interesting one. The other one, you can go on, on the web, and, and there's my colleagues. I, 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 these are uh, ro TVA robo houses, we dubbed them. Uh, it, it, they were picked out houses right near me where I could go to every day. But I didn't have to mess with the occupants, that we actually had robots inside showering, and even the behavior of the latent and, um, and sensible loads coming from occupants. So all these houses side by side. So if there's any question about occupancy differences, that's why that one was so much more comfortable. We took that out of the equation. So I'm going to touch on that one. And then the one that I'm, I'm, I'm immersed in right now is this um, this house, where, where this project where I've, I've just recently been in the living rooms of 38 homeowners from low income to doctor and doctor, blah, blah, blah. You know, so the full spectrum and trying to introduce these various technologies that will not only save energy, but also help it all be Wi-Fi controlled by the electric utility. Uh, okay, I have the next one. So here was a picture backside during construction of this uh, mega house. And uh, I, I know many of you contractors have this all the time. Okay, really nice house. Oh, oh, oh man, big budget for HVAC. Well, no. This was, this was not only small budget, but in the very small corner in the uh, very far end was a room that you could barely call a closet, and that's where the HVAC wanted to be. Okay, well, what happened to the idea of a nice central HVAC system where you could easily distribute from and, and, and minimize your duck losses and all this other stuff? Well, that wasn't in the equation. In fact, the dog room got top billing here. It took two-thirds of the original equipment room so the dog could go in and out and, and have his own place where he could entertain and such. And so I'm going to show you kind of the challenge, and it was kind of like a Chinese puzzle that didn't really want to go together. And then the other thing here was this was in an area that new code was being rolled in. So all these builders are, are just, yeah, 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 I know how to do all that. Well, come the end when they find out they don't know how to do all that, well, what do you got left that's not in the building? Well, could we upgrade the HVAC? And in this case, this is an example that it came to the rescue. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I don't want to go too deep into this, but you know, yeah, OK, here we go. We got the floor trusses. And of course, I went to the truss manufacturer. And I said, give me a great big open chase to run off the HVAC. And after he stopped laughing, he gave me a little bitty square area. And he says, oh, how's that? And I go, well, that's, that's not that good, that good. But anyway, so it starts with this. Uh, constraint of getting out of a very small space into this very large house. And then uh, it, it, 
and so I, I'm not want to spend a lot of time, but as a as an advisor, I, you know, I sketched up. Well, here's the two two unit system, which is a way, another way of modulating, but a much more elegant one is in, shown in the next slide, where I have just one system, and you can see a couple little motorized dampers there. Well, who's very conducive to zoning? Well, here we go. Variable capacity can deliver, you know, that kind of challenge, and and. Uh, if uh, one thing I, I, I had on the floor plan was a little study that was in the lower level of which the program for this house was, that study's very important. I want to never think about comfort in my study because there's where I'm winning, going to win the Nobel Prize, and that's where I do all my thinking. Okay, so that's on the same floor as the basement right next to it that doesn't want to be heated and cooled and dehumidified right now because we didn't have enough money. Okay, so, so you know, to be able to deliver a supply and a return these kind of tricks, you have a standing chance with, with zoning and variable capacity, whereas you, you don't even want to try uh, with, with, without that kind of capability. So if I could go to the next one. So yeah, I know many of you have, 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 have done this with, uh, you, you know that as it gets colder and the bottom axis is your outside, your house demands the blue line more and more um, uh, uh, heating, and then you see the lower uh, level at these various temperatures, then you see the maximum. And all of these, everything in between, can be tuned with a completely variable capacity. But of course, here's your design condition in this area at about 19, 18 degrees. And here what came up an issue that was really something that I learned. Uh, the supplemental heat needed here was 7.32. Well, okay, what came to me was, oh, we're already paying an arm and a leg to bring this huge copper wire into this house. You know, don't, don't hurt us on that. Okay, well, look what would happen on the next slide, if you want, Brandy. Yeah, and it's going to be a little confusing, but what I've added is your, your, your fixed speed right there by the uh, uh, pink line. And the point I want to make is look at your, your, your supplemental heat for that, the area, the, the distance here compared to that. So in other words, you've got twice that capacity that you have online. And in this particular house, even though it's a million and a half dollars some house, this was a huge issue because all the, the, the electrical plugs and lights, there were something like 250 lights in this house. And that was an interesting one. I asked the homeowner at some point, so are you going to put in uh, CFLs or, or compact fluorescents or, you know, or incandescent? You know, I haven't thought about that. I don't know what's in the budget. You know, probably not that much. You know, so it, it, it's interesting what's out there, and, um, and, and you kind of know what kind of nightmare you can create in a house that's got a lot of heat generating bulbs. So I'm, I'm very much about the perspective, but a key player is that tool in the case of the variable capacity. If I could have the next one, please. And so uh, what I did here, in the, the middle one, the two-stage, was, was something that it, it turned out that's what they ended up going to, a very high-end two-stage system. Uh, we didn't get all the way to variable capacity, but we went from low cost, uh, I'm not sure it would run, kind of budget and system that we started with. So on the far uh, uh, left, you see the full modulating, full variable capacity, the energy, uh, the red being the heating and the blue being the, the cooling, and then you see it next to the two-stage. And this is a model, and the middle run I made just for this presentation so that we could distinguish. And you can see real quickly, you get a, you get a pretty good hunk at least going to the two-stage, uh, and the next slide will we'll, we'll talk to you a little bit about the cost, but then the fixed speed, you, you see that, that going off the, out, out of the roof. A lot of numbers here. I'm not going to dig into them, but I've, I, the, uh, the column variable speed, those are real numbers that were presented to the contractor, to the homeowner. And then the, the, the far, on the two on the right, the spingle speed with the gas furnace and then the low cost system were done for this project. And then for this presentation, we added the cost, and that came from uh, some some customer survey data that we use specifically this for this presentation. So you see, at a, a pretty small premium, you capture a lot of that capacity variation of variability uh, benefit. Next slide, please. And here's just uh, taking those those energy savings and and seeing what your actual uh, difference was for these three cases of the the all heat pumps, the variable speed, the two-stage, and the low cost. And yes, indeed, you're going to pay more uh, on a first cost basis uh, that first year of $11,000 for the 
full Monty on the variable speed, and yes, you're going to pay uh, 2,500 more for the, uh, and this is compared to a base case of the, the gas and the SEER 13. And then, of course, you can save a Say five thousand dollars if you actually went to that that very low cost. But here's I, I, don't 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 in the next slide I want to show you. I, this is something that's very valuable as a sales point, and I want to show you the equation. And and you gotta you can customize this um, because you can actually use whatever their interest rate is, whether it be a, a home restoration rate or a mortgage. And what I suggest like fifteen years because that's what we know is the average life of a heat pump. It, it's getting longer every day, at least you know with better technologies. But you want to present something in in, in in that incremental cost, and you want to get over that. And and there's a way of normalizing that. And this is the equation. And and it's kind of like how we buy cars. Why don't we you know buy heat pumps like that? You know, kind of on a monthly expense basis. So this this just puts in the same annual per basis your annual energy savings and your actual annual energy expense, including your interest rate and your term of your loan, that is it's pretty acceptable and can be placed in the terms that your 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 uh, your customers should be able to understand easily. If I could have the next one. So I, I use that equation and I ran through and you remember the highest cost, first cost was the variable uh, uh, speed system and that uh, saved on an annual basis, even though it costs more up front, but that's got a $267, and this is, you know, like, like I say, very, very precise, uh, consistent basis uh, c compared to that base case system. And, and, and there you, you see the first year you get this savings if you account for you know, you know, that, uh, that, that, that mortgage payment. If I could have the next slide, please. Oh, so, Jeff, um Looking at some of that data that you just showed us, there's times when um, a variable speed or a variable capacity unit might be the best one to meet the challenges, and then there's also times it looks like that that two-stage, particularly when you have some challenges to meet, they want some comfort, but the budget uh, is a little bit tighter, that might be a better option. It, it, is that what I'm... Absolutely, and um, what, what happens with that is, is, is like I say, even in that very high end, that, that budget was a, was a constraint. But what, what, what we have here is the, uh, we're, we're comparing, that's, you know, that's, that's, so that's the variable heat pump versus that fixed speed. So uh, in this case, what you're showing is a minus two, that's a savings of that amount. And another way of saying this is that extra $11,000 gives you a, a nine-year simple payback. Uh, but again, you're you're right. It's not on here, but the ultra check would 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 show even a, a even a, a a smaller simple payback. But but nine years on something that's going to last fifteen, still a pretty good deal. We'll go Might one. be better payback than the large dog room. <laughs> I don't know. You got to have a lot of love for the dog, and this dog was yeah very well yeah. That's true. We can't. We got to do that. Yeah. So tell yeah. me about Knoxville. Okay, so so um, w w this is Knoxville's uh, actual rates um, that they used, and what and these were the three, the four different systems that were talked about. I haven't mentioned the word mini split until this slide, and I've pulled all my work on that. But one of the things the client had heard about was mini splits, and so we put put the mini splits. We hung one on every wall, and and. Uh, uh, crank through the numbers, and, and as far as performance, well, it wasn't quite as good as the variable capacity and uh, as far as energy savings, but also the a homeowner was from India and was familiar from her time in Bombay and was very familiar with mini splits that are hanging on walls everywhere and um, said, you know what, I, I, I know they're very nice, but I don't want that in my $1.5 million house. And, um, and it was really an aesthetic issue that knocked it out before a great deal of attention was paid to this. But nevertheless, we have this very nice presentation of these systems. And so then I, I, I said, well, you know, I, I, I want to show the rest of the world this is not only a Knoxville phenomenon. So if you'd show me the next slide. I crank all I did, change the model, resize, put in my, my, my model, or Orlando weather tape, and again, uh, the variable uh, speed uh, comes out with a, a nice energy savings per year. And not the slight where many of you are from, more northerly climates. If you look at the next slide, we ran it for uh, Columbus, 
Uh, and uh, again, similar story. Uh, and I, the only adjustment was true energy costs, electricity, in, in this case, the far left, gas, and uh, the weather. So if we could go, go on. Huh. OK, so we go from the Taj Mahal to this house. Well, that brings me to a question, because this house is uh, more in my line of, of thinking for <laughs> what I could do. But I, if I, I can am, see you living in this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it might work for me. Um, but if, I, if I'm still try, striving to get to like a net zero or a minimal amount of usage, uh, a maximum efficiency, is it better for me to start with a new home or looking at this study, is it better for me to try to retrofit uh, an existing home like this? I, I, I have a hard time not, not laughing out loud uh, be, because I, I have taken so many older houses, probably 200 older houses, and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show that I don't have to build a whole new house. I can get this to, zero, to near zero. And, and I, 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 there's hardly any hair left on my head trying to chase particularly things like air tightness in these houses. I mean, we'll start with like an ungodly 18 air changes. It's like, what? Is that a tenth? Well, it doesn't look like a tenth, but it behaves like one. And, and you begin to think, hey, I know where all these things are. And, and so I've worked with uh, insulators, and who's got this gigantic foam truck that can foam up the whole house, turn it into an igloo. You know? And I said, no, 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 wait, just do piece by piece. And then I would circle after my blower door, where all the holes were. Okay, come on back. And, and you crank it back up and seal. And you're, 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 so the simple answer is if you got the money, I'd always start with a new house. But we know that that's, that's not happening. So, but, but here, after a professional career towards the end of chasing the holy grail of zero energy, I thought, you know what? I know how to do this. So this is a house that I currently own. Uh, it's for rent, by the way, if anyone wants to uh, uh, come live in Knoxville. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, but here, I, 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 I studied the pants out of this. You should, I, I'd make a terrible real estate agent as I talk about what I'm going to show you guys. Not everybody out there is, I, I, I realize, not into the level of energy savings as uh, home, home, home shoppers. But I drilled and filled. I, I pulled off the, all the siding. I made sure, I infrared camera, make sure they didn't miss anything. I went up in the attic. I did R58 up in the attic. And they started to blow it without baffles. I said, oh, shut that machine off. Get the baffles in. Yeah. Everything to the book. And next slide, please. And then, of course, there, the one on the right is what I found with the, uh, the, the unit that's in there, uh, a very nice uh, aspirating uh, gas furnace and about a 20-year-old uh, Coil still still working and still uh, actually kept the house cool for all intents and it, it pretty pretty large cool one minute not so good the next but anyway and then what what I, what I wanted to, on, on the right was a variable capacity but one of the things that I realized and I had not seen Randy's pres customer um, response on 59 percent of these units are bought under duress but I kind of you kind of intuitively know that and so I thought well well yeah I need heating and cooling so let's do that the first thing so. The actual manual J on that house when it started was a three-ton system. So I thought, well, what if you went and bought a three-ton? You know, what would happen? So indeed, what happens is you see this is a HERS rating, and I want to introduce this HERS rating, although I think many of you understand. This is kind of the blessed system that's national around the country, and about 100 is code built house from a, you know, kind of a couple years ago, and this house uh, with the activities that were done to it, we, you know, are in a neighborhood of 65. When we're talking retrofit houses, this starts at, you know, 160. This house was like 147. When I find insulation in the walls in this climate, I usually get about 120. But I'm, this whole thing is, it's hard to go through all this, and I'm really not going to slow down to, to get to it all. But the big finding is whether I do this first or whether I do this last, the big savings really comes from going to a variable speed system. And, and, you know, so from day one, I get that system, and whereas if I did all this other stuff with a fixed speed, instead of making my house more comfortable, it would be less comfortable as time went on, particularly in the cooling season. So it was just, you know, it, it's something that fell out of this analysis that obviously in, in spades plays to the strength of, of this technology that we're talking about in this webinar. Next slide, please. Uh, I, this just talks about the ratings. And whether it's ResNet or whatever, 
the ratings are populating. It's trending upward everywhere. The miles per gallon, call it what, what, you, what you wish. But it's a way of communicating to your customers in a simple single number where, where these homes stand. And it's pretty easy for almost anybody now to go online and calculate these things. And I, 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 I've already made the point, uh, it's, it's used on existing and new homes. And utility is a surprising proponent of, uh, of these variable capacity systems. And they're working themselves slowly, although this is like time of day rates. It, will we ever really have appraisers that recognize the energy efficiency? In some areas, they're getting real, really there. And uh, it's just not in, in everybody's neighborhood yet. So same data but I just present it on a uh, simple payback that everybody kind of understands. Here's your nine, 10 year for the variable capacity. The one that gets interestingly put in in so many homes, because everybody sees them just like the granite countertops that Brandy likes, uh, but, but, it, but it's, 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 it's the wrong thing to do on the energy savings, a 60 year payback. Well, I'm obviously getting paid back for something other than saving energy with those replacements. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm kind of hammering on some of the same stuff, but the obvious one on this, when, these, when you take these houses and everybody eventually is going to be slammed with dramatic uh, different energy prices, although we're not living in that moment at, at, at this time, but although where I am with the January 1 uh, time of day rates, some people are going to see, without doing anything to their home, $600 additional costs. And so when they start doing things, you're spending most of your time in that part load. And with that efficiency being high, high there, for even a perfectly good unit, you're, you're, you're not going to be penalized nearly as much. Uh, something that I'm going to talk about just very, very briefly, th these are ORNL field verified numbers when I talk about the low number that I got in the fixed and, the, and indeed, the, the, the as-bill performance that I got with the variable capacity. I'm going to give you the reference in the, ne in the next slide. So oversizing, as already mentioned, was uh, 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 not, uh, not as harmful. But the word manual J, I think, is finally getting in the hands of many customers, many codes. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, uh oh, now what have we done? We kind of kind of have to make exceptions here for this technology. But the point is that people know what these loads are more and more, and, uh, and they know their dynamic. So the idea of that being out there is um, cr creating a demand for a variable uh, speed drivers. Uh, you know, we know about the short cycling, turning things on and off. It's interesting. Some of these houses that have been in of late, I, I, I can tell. The people that have a high energy bill, that have oversized units, there's little respirators by their night table. Health and high energy, health and fixed speed, I'm just wondering if there's a correlation. And, um, and it's just something that's kind of on my mind these days as I'm meeting these people in their living rooms and, what, and talking comfort and, 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 and energy costs. So, um, I think we've, we've hit on some of these uh, benefits already. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, the small house, there's been some very, very valuable lessons that all apply to variable capacity. Uh, you, you can see that you start with, on, the, on this first one, you start with some pretty, pretty high houses. Uh, and they generally, uh, to get to this five air changes, is almost like impossible with many houses. Yet codes, new standards today, you can't get an occupancy permit until you get to three. Yeah, so but we're finding this seven, seven to twenty. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, you know, obviously the energy savings and uh, and the homeowners' uh, uh, motivation. You know, the, the, but I, I guess I'm just going to underline again the interesting thing that you can go into a restoration with an oversized system when it's all done, but with a right size system with your start and uh, find that to be just an intriguing option that uh, I think that might actually be preventing people from doing energy efficiency in other parts of their home without a variable capacity uh, attached to their home. Well, that makes good so. sense. So uh, upgrading the HVAC is probably a really good first step because to your point, it's a big payback. You get uh, energy efficient from day one, and it will right size itself to uh, the improvements in the house that you make as you go along. Exactly. And then another real life finding. When I, and I just completed the inspection of these 38 houses, of which about 18 of them had heat, new heat pumps installed. The problems I'm having are somebody missed going up in the attic and 
sucking fiberglass and moving all the fiberglass aside and didn't seal that attic plane right. But you know, the problems with the installs on the HVAC <laughs> are like a non-existent. So it's just less pain, less, you know, it's just it's just interesting. Okay, here is the uh, this historic house. This house won a wonderful award uh, that they were very proud of, a LEED Platinum Award. They wouldn't have got it without the SEER 20, that 21 that got put in this house that you can see in that corner. And it brings out the point of if you're wanting to stand out in the crowd in your local market, there's things like this that set you apart and whether it be a LEED Platinum Award, but it's just nice to have those shingles to hang on your website and to have in your book as you're sitting across trying to decide which, why that system costs so much more. You know, it, 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 it's, uh, and that's what happened in space. And the other thing that I think is really, who owned this house at first was called Knox Heritage. They buy old, historically significant houses and restore them and put them back on the market. And so this house was fragile. It had 100-year-old wood. And we didn't want to use foam in certain places just because of that moisture trapping. And, and what it delivered was both tremendous energy savings and uh, 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 kept, it kept the moisture very nice. And just to kind of show you the extremes, and I, 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 do not, I, I did not patent this, and it, it wasn't very cost effective. but. It actually, we interfaced with the control board in this unit. It, we, and we told it, when we're running the kitchen fan, the bathroom fan, and the dryer, and these houses, some of them are so tight that this, this gets to be port, important. And with that, with the help of the smarts inside this unit, we're able to keep the pressure neutral and provide more fresh air. Okay, next slide, please. And I, I'm, I'm doing nothing more here. I don't want you to necessarily read this, but this is one of the reports from my model that, that spits out the actual annual cooling load in this house, only $125 for the full year and less than $500 heating, and the HERS of 49, which is 50% tighter than a currently code-enforced new house in that city, and, and, and Knoxville has been very progressive in adopting the more recent, much more stringent codes. That's a great result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, oh, everybody's very, very proud of that house. And, it, and it's, it, it, yeah, yeah, it's all kinds of good stories about it. Um, so here's the uh, uh, annual savings for that house with the uh, variable capacity. Again, the same kind of performance stuff shown you actually in the, the mega house and that, uh, that annual savings of uh, an energy of uh, about 600 bucks. Okay, this is our last, uh, next to last study. Uh, the uh, Robo House, um, this house is, in, and we talk, uh, you know, of the importance of, of making sure people appreciate this elusive thing called comfort. And, and to put numbers to this, I want to show you the extremes that your tax dollars and a little bit of TVA's utility dollars went towards getting the variations out so we could really study comfort. And in this house, we had... Uh, in fact, we even had comfort meters that wrapped our meter with little fur that accounted for more clothing. And we actually made it go through little various exercises, like it was uh, not just sitting watching television, but maybe cooking in the kitchen. And so we did tons of moisture measurements and comfort measurements. And all the systems that were talked about were rotated in and out of these houses. And, and here's where we found the pretty low performance on what the builder had put in this house. By golly, he, he went out and he bid, he got four bids, and this indeed was low cost. And this indeed was also low performance. And, 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 and an enormous expense put and hand selected the builder so that he could build what he always built. Not, and, and by the way, when this was all done, he was, he was a born-again Christian. And it's not just because my name is Christian. He, he, he <laughs> said he never will build a house like he was before. And, and, and the house that's not shown here is a near-zero energy house. And we did the full Monty in there. And oh, by the way, um, there we started with a similar to an Ultratech. And we also tested the variable capacity. And we also tossed, tested mini splits, both hanging on the walls and in a duct. And the one that was hanging on the walls that got put into us not only didn't 
it oh not only used more energy, it also wasn't a fair comparison because it didn't take the moisture out of the house because the fan always ran. And um, so uh, 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 I totally behaved myself on some of this stuff, and I may have just gone, gone over the line. Uh, OK, so here is, is kind of the, some of the stuff that we collected on um, uh, uh, the, some of the inverter systems. The blue line is more or less this, this fixed speed. And you can see at the cold temperatures, and we just we normalized everything. And again, whatever's going on in, in one house is going on in another. So these are real clean numbers. And the only problem with this slide when I talk to a utility person is they, hey, what the heck does that mean, daily peak, you know, daily numbers? You know, what they want to see is a two or three hour period. But I'm going to tell you that they may even be higher when you look at more narrow periods. But you can see like a 75% reduction. Now, if, if somebody's paying through the nose on a cold January day, that's going to mean a lot. And, and where I'm sitting right now, starting January 1, that's a big deal. So you can see these near um, you know, 5 kW and under for the, the systems. And that's the difference there is with the, with the defrost cycle on and off um, which is to get those low numbers. OK. Well, good. Um, thank you, Jeff. I want to jump to some questions that we've received from the group. So could you explain the HERS rating a little more to the group? HERS rating, uh, if you allow me a little bit of liberty, is that when you put it into a blessed model, and ResNet controls this, and they say you can only use certain models, energy gauge, I use that, REM rate, I use that. These are numbers that have passed a little criteria that use an hourly simulation to produce a rating. And it has to do with the annual energy that gets consumed. But it ends up being normalized, hand wave, hand wave, hand wave. Around 100 ends up being a typical new home. So then we brag about it when we talk about these HERS, as I did in this presentation, of 49. That roughly means a 51% whole house energy savings including the energy used by the occupants. But we put the same occupant in our computer in the comparison house. So we kind of, it's called an asset rating. So it takes out in, in the computer the variability of occupancy. So it's a good way to really judge all the different ways to improve uh, energy efficiency or to rate them that's available for the home, whether it is an HVAC system with SEER or HSPF, as well as Windows. Um, insulation and some of the other choices, right? Exactly. And as I did in that one, well, the one house where you can, and that's, those are all outputs, and they're put as outputs in the res, the res, uh, ResNet uh, uh, metric. Another question we have is, um, do you get the same, or can you tell us the difference in benefits between a mini split system that uses a variable speed technology and a traditional split system? like the one you showed in the house that uses variable speed technology? What are, because they both have that variable capacity, but what are you really seeing in the, the differences between well, those in a home? When, when, when they're priced in the, in the and, and there are some, although when I've priced them of recent, they're, they're fairly pricey, uh, but you can put them in a duct system. And I get very similar performance as the, the, you know, the, the variable capacity system, the high-end one that I was talking about here. When we talk about dispersing it um, in the home, uh, there's, there's, there's ways of doing these very, very effectively. And, and there's a lot of people that really believe when we talk about a zero energy house, that's all you got to do is just put on one mini split. But, but the, the solution of going back to the fireplace of without the distribution of having one room very comfortable, and if you really want to be comfortable going near the fireplace or where the mini split is providing ideal comfort, you know, is, is, is going to work in some situations, but, but not in many. Certainly, you know, in the mega house, you've got to talk about large numbers of these. And, um, and yes, you can get very good, very good control when properly installed from, from the energy and potentially from the comfort, but one also has to account for the aesthetics. And in the robo houses, I want to tell you that kind of before I got there one morning, even though this house was very close to my house, the, the contractor had drilled holes through the walls and ran those set lines down the outside. Granted, it was final siding to start with, but nevertheless, it was 
unsightly to to, uh, to have to have to do that. And and then of course the next day when it was very cold, I went and took an infrared camera, and it wasn't a leak; it was the heat from the line set that was just jumping out at you. So so. Yes, there's very, very excellent applications for small rooms and places like that, but they, they have to be used with care and target and a, a targeted solution. Okay, thank you. One other question that we've received, um, if we have time for. We've heard about the ACE, the ACA manual J calculation. Can you talk about other calculations like manual D? Are there three or four calculations that I, as a contractor, should be sure to do? Thank you. That's a perfect question. Uh, yes, you want to do the manual J. It gives you your peak design, cooling, and heating load sensible and late. And then you take that and you go into, um, you, go, you go two, to two directions, but your, your manual D is for proper sizing of your duct systems. And you, dr you drive off of the, the fan and the pressure and the vat from the unit that you now are thinking is the right unit that you want. Although I will state between manual J and manual D is S. And S is something that says if indeed you're heating and cooling, you can oversize. And here's where there's an intense discussion around how much oversizing you can do. And it's the recognition of this variable capacity. And many people believe, well, gee, since I can operate in that low speed, why can't that you know, be the number that we use and not that, that high end? And what happens then is you can target that on the cooling and then go real deep on the capacity as it gets very cold. Uh, so the difference is manual J sizes the heating and cooling load, manual D properly sizes the ducts. And by the way, I find that people might be willing to do the manual Js, but the manual Ds, oh, well, you never know what you're going to run into the field, so I do these calculations and then there's a, there's a, a stick in my way and I have to go around anyway. You know, I, I, I don't buy that. I think there's tools that do this very simple and that maybe some you know, kind of recognition of some of these obstacles that might put a couple more elbows in, uh, you know, you really needs, really needs to be done. Well, excellent. Uh, I wanted to thank you. Um, also to the, to the group, those folks on the webinar, that the, at the end of the session, we will have the slides and a recording of the session will be available on our Designer Air website along with all the questions. There were several questions received that have been answered one-on-one -on -one that weren't necessarily presented during the time period. Those will also be available from today's presentation out on the website. So Jeff, I wanted to thank you and I wish you best of luck in, in the projects that you're working on, the extreme makeovers that you're right in the middle of, and we certainly appreciated your time today. So thanks to all at the webinar and we'll be looking forward to having you join us on our next session of the Designer Air webinar, which will be part two for residential. Thank you. <laughs>